Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the post-lunch slot. This is not the sleepy slot. This is the quick-fire, exciting innovation spot. So I hope you've all had a lovely lunch and are ready to hear about some fantastic startups in the sustainable event space. My name is Abana Fairweather, and I'm the founder and CEO of Legacy Marketplace. So Legacy Marketplace is a platform that anyone organizing an event can use to make their sus event sustainable. We source all kinds of products, services, and venues, right from sustainable badges and lanyards, right through to sustainable venues. And the idea is it makes it easier for anyone doing that to ensure that what they're using for their event is sustainable. So I spend all my days meeting really exciting startups pitching sustainable products and services. So I couldn't be more excited to be on this stage today with our, with our four startups here today and one joining us online. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists who are going to talk about their product. Each of them will have five minutes to pitch their service or product to you, explain exactly what it does, and then we'll move on to the next. So that's the quick fire nature of this round. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce from left to right, Chris Mastricci. He's going to be introducing the SWRD. He tells me it's about binovation and bingagement. So encouraging gamification to, for correct bin use. Then we have Danny McCletchie joining us on Zoom. We have Thomas Richardson from Gaia, the Global Ecological Innovation uh, Agency. We have Gwen Sharp from the Green Room, and we have Cerise Cooper from Again. So handing over to Chris first, please tell us all about the innovation and the engagement. Yeah, with slides? Not in a mean way, I can start. Hi. Um, this is yours. <laughs> <laughs> this is Gwen's amazing organization. I don't know very much about it. Um, there will be some slides with green things. But I can start. My name's Chris. Um, I set up a charity festival waste reuse and diversion as a response to tent abandonment. And we got quite good at salvaging afterwards and collecting lots of abandoned kit and getting it to where it can be used or turned into other things. And the better you get at it, the more it kind of reinforces the subliminal thing that it does all go to charity. So we're kind of focusing now more on engaging people and um, yeah, the behavior change side of it to try and reduce the amount of things left behind. Um, hi, these are mine. Um, <laughs> bin engagement, just, just engaging people in better bin use through gamification, signage, and positive experience. Not many people have had uh, a positive experience with a bin, so there's a few trials that I'd like to run this year to maybe create those neuronic pathways and get people going, do you remember using that funny bin? Um, as I say, the gap between expectation and reality. So a lot of festivals have these pledges and they get attendees to, um, should not look, <laughs> sorry. Um, they ask attendees to do certain things, but there's very little by way of kind of on-site support to make it happen. And in the face of a four-day party, people's ability or, yeah, people's capability and motivation somewhat dwindles. So the aim with the different trials we want to do is developing the culture of care to try and make some lasting change and then hopefully create a pathway for people to be able to engage more in the other amazing sustainable things on site. Hi. So here are some questions. Uh, all of the questions are, are things that I'm trying to answer this, this summer and next summer in different trials. But the overrunning theme is how can we make it as easy as possible for people to do the right thing? So uh, I'll rattle through these because time is a thing. Um, first one, what if attendees knew where the bins were? I've done quite a lot of litter picking in my time. And before people litter, it gives this kind of 120 degree like, ah. So what if there was a massive bin sign, like a two meter sign above a bin that says bin with an arrow? Not saying someone's going to dash away from their friends and go and use it, but they know it's there on a certain level. So that's the, the, the most hands-off thing that I'd like to try, because if it works at all, that's a real no-brainer. That's, that's quite easy. Um, and the other one, what if improved recycling rates were a friendly chat away? 
I think uh, I've seen at Bonnaroo in America where they have trash talkers. They're people that are based at the bin stations and in a slightly american -y way, just a really hyping correct bin use. Um, I think tailoring that to a more British culture of directly rewarding it, stickers, stamps, or you know any, anything um, could have real merit. And doing that in the first couple of days of an event, you can just politely explain to someone that the straws are compostable, mm -hmm. and hopefully that information can disseminate um, if you're catching people early before they're a bit tired and run down. Um, there's a lot of puns in, in the bin world. So what if we were to bin-tercept people, i.e. intercept people with bins, um, as an act finishes? So as an act finishes, um, ideally have someone jump on the microphone and go, we're going to put another tune on, and the volume will be dictated by how many people are just tidying up. Um, so bringing in prizes and a few games and a few little bits um, to kind of capitalize on the good time as opposed to running in direct conflict with it. I feel like a lot of times people are asked to step out of the good time to think sustainably, whereas I think bringing the sustainable ask into the good time uh, could have some real merit. Um, and then final one, when was the last time anyone had a positive experience with a bin? Genuine show of hands. Has anyone had a nice time with a bin? No? <laughs> Fair. Um, <laughs> yeah? I would love to know what it is because I've, I, I have. Um, we're designing a wheelie bin sound system. I don't know if you've seen them. They're just converted wheelie bins that make loads of noise. Um, a lot of the ones I've seen out there have, uh, wow, um, have the decks on top of the bin. So the bin isn't actually usable. And I think there's a merit to leaving the top bit usable. And you can have these tunes coming out and have this good time. And then someone is actually able to interact directly with that. Um, and then you can do all sorts. You'd have the bin say thank you. Or like, yeah, uh, re like reward it. Prizes, games, entered into competitions. There's lots of scope for it. Um, it's just a case of finding events that are willing to let me try it. Because nothing changes until things are tried and there's a proof of concept. And I'm basically bored of I reckons. And for the last five seconds, here's some things. Uh, it will all be written up into a report afterwards, um, which will be freely available because change needs to happen. And I'm not precious about it. I just want it to happen. Uh, so the more events involved, uh, then the more relevant it will be. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Please bin to set Chris afterwards if you'd like to talk more about bins. And next we have Danny McCletchy joining us from Zoom uh, online. So hopefully through the magic of technology, Danny will appear now. Hi, Danny. Good uh, afternoon. Over here is morning time in Trinidad. Uh, my name is Danny McCletchy, and I am the co-founder and CEO of Innocenco. So happy to be here. Um, I cannot see this, so um, I, I can't see the presentation that I prepared for you. So I will just talk about what we do. So Carnival Cycle is a social enterprise that is geared towards making Carnival and Caribbean culture more sustainable. Our mission is to bridge the gap between Caribbean culture and sustainability. Um, show of hands, I <laughs> can't see you guys, but uh, how many of you guys have, ex have been exposed to Caribbean Carnival? Okay, uh, maybe instead of showing your hands, maybe you can say me, <laughs> so I can hear. Yay, <laughs> we have some folks. So um, uh, there are actually carnivals all across um, Europe, and there's actually the very popular carnival in Notting Hill um, in, in London. And so, yeah, carnival is a very important staple to Caribbean culture. Um, it was uh, founded when um, French settlers came to the Caribbean, namely Trinidad and Tobago, um, and slaves were not invited to their masquerade ball, so we made our own mask, and that has now turned into carnival. So as fun um, as carnival is, we do a lot of 
of drinking and partying is still uh, that that is of freedom and liberation. But as fun as it is, there is a lot of risk associated with carnival. So we work on making carnival sustainable, and we are the first to pioneer this solution um, through two different ways: through carnival events, which includes parties, which we call fets. Um, events as well as parades, as well as through carnival fashion. So we include carnival costumes, um, as well as what we call Monday and Tuesday. Juve is a celebration where we empower someone on us. So I have my carnival cycle shirt with paint and powder all, just all holding it. <laughs> um, and so through um, uh, the carnival events, as to any other type of big festival, or even large music festival, you have your plastics, your aluminum economies, you have your um, decoration waste, and um, also waste from utilities, from the sound systems, the lights, the stage lights and generators, those sort of things. So we work in a way where we collaborate with existing recyclers on the island, and with the between the carnival stakeholders, the promoters, the organizers, as well as the recyclers, because there's a large disconnect. So we've become kind of the middleman, um, but an important middleman in terms of uh, getting recycling at um, more fets and festivals. Carnival season in Trinidad and Tobago, there's over 200 different fets or events. So you can imagine how much waste is produced from each of those events of varying sizes, and um, less than 5% of those events have recycling in them. And so with that being said, we're also collecting data at these events. We are um, uh, collecting how much uh, waste and recycling there is. When it comes to carnival fashion, we are the first to recycle the costumes. So costumes are made out of rhinestones, feathers, and gems, and we're the first to um, capture those resources, uh, break them down, and then clean them, and then put them back into the costume network of burlesque designers, carnival costumes, and samba designers to use those materials for future designs, creating a circular economy. Um, so that has been our large in largest initiative thus far. And um, thus far, we've been able to be featured in search papers for this action, as well as collect and recycle over 1,200 costumes. Um, and right now, we're in the midst of seeking funding to expand um, both solutions. So thank you for your time. And yes. <laughs> Thank you, Danny, for giving us an overview of some of the great things you're doing to make Carnival more sustainable. Because it's a quick fire round, though, I have to move quickly on to our next pitcher, who is Thomas Richardson, who is going to be talking about Gaia. Hi, guys. My name is Thomas Richardson. I am the founder of the Irish-based startup Gaia, the global ecological investment agency, which I know makes me sound like I'm a hedge fund manager, but I'm not. And for the last number of years, I've been designing and building gardens. And it was during a winter break from this in 2019 that I started to dream up Gaia. So I went home and started to build it. And it's been a steep learning curve, but one that introduced me to the regenerative movement. And my world has changed forever. Uh, so I set Gaia up to get funding for these Biosphere Regen platforms and projects. <clears throat> and I've completely uh, forgotten where I'm going with this. Sorry, guys. but. Uh, full of nerves. I'm not one for speaking, okay? Huh? Just, me. Just means I care, thank you. Uh, when I originally got into this, I was going to set up a charity that planted trees, but the more I researched it, the more I realized that there was issues with both of these things, and that what we need is um, a radical rethink of the, our entire approach. Uh, for instance, with a lot of these, give us a book and we'll plant you a tree schemes, it's often the wrong tree in the wrong place for the wrong people. And worse than that, carbon credits from corporate land banks. Now, I'm not suggesting that there's not some great nonprofits out there doing awesome work, but just that what we need is we need multiple strategies, ones that empower people to be the keystone species that we can be. Uh, so I got to thinking what I can do about that. 
and so the GeoBlock was born. Uh, we take the latest in technology, uh, coupled with on-the-ground local knowledge and the best and brightest international thinking to create projects that look at the biodiversity, the social and the um, financial um, aspects of a project in harmony. When you consider these three things um, holistically, then it ensures the long-term viability of the project. Um, I'm really sorry, guys. I'm very sorry. Um, also, I can't emphasize enough that these are not, <laughs> also I can't emphasize enough that these are not um, carbon credits, that more a blended offset approach, one that looks at biodiversity as the main marker. When we just look at carbon, it's a very reductionist way of dealing with an incredibly complex problem. When a, when a, a Sitka spruce plantation, for instance, can be considered a carbon sink worthy of accreditation, then you can start to see my point. And it's worse than that. We've got corporate entities buying up huge land banks in the developing world, ring fencing it, planting monocrops on it, and calling it a carbon sink, often with um, felling licenses pre-approved. So what is a geoblock? A geoblock is a smart contract that represents one square meter of land. We take a project, create a polygon, and then we break it down into square meters, i.e. a geoblock. Each one is then embedded with all the information about that project, for instance, land ownership, intervention type, land condition, coordinates, etc. Then individuals or companies wishing to support the projects purchase the geoblocks, and these come in the form of an NFT, which again is unique to the project and the company supporting it. Each one of these NFTs can then be fragmented into geoblocks, and these can then be embedded into your product or service in the form of a QR code, which when activated, takes you to an interactive dashboard that's unique again to that project. These dashboards are continuously updated in line with the progress of the project. So what sets us apart? Well, for one, we don't require any um, sovereign rights to the land, just that the people that we're doing the interventions for have some form of um, land tenure. Some form of land tenure, <laughs> sorry. I'm very sorry, guys. Um, this usually involves the landowners. So then, um, sorry, so then we, um, we utilize our network and we get people to do the work. And this usually involves the landowners who get paid to restore their own land whilst learning about the species being planted. Um, and these, in the, for in the cases of syntropic agroforestry and rewilding, we go into local pockets of biodiversity and we extract mycelium and seedlings and then we propagate them on site, ensuring that we have the right tree in the right place. Um, on top of that, then, we help them to capitalize on the natural capital potential, and we also connect them, with, uh, we connect them with platforms to help them take their produce to market, ensuring that they get the best possible deal. Um, sorry, I'm probably running way over time here. I'm definitely running way over time. I'm still in 20 seconds. <laughs> Shit. I, <laughs> do you know how long I spent learning this fucking thing? <laughs> <laughs> seriously, seriously, seriously. Okay, so look, how does it break down and how much do these projects cost? All right. <laughs> uh, the cost of each project is different, so, but the cost of the block is representative of its portion of the project. But they usually start off as little as one euro per block. Okay, and this breaks down as such. 60% goes directly to the, the 60% goes directly to the project. 60% goes directly to the project, 20% goes towards verification and monitoring, 10 to 15% goes to Gaia for platform upkeep, NFT minting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, there's 5 to 10% then, which we use then to build nurseries in the communities, which are community owned and run, uh, creating much needed employment, but also boosting their regen capacity. Uh, these are also represented on the NFT, giving credit to the donors. And finally, I'd like to give a big shout out to the Shindig family for believing in and supporting this project. And thank you guys, and I hope you see the uh, value in this venture. And sorry for... <laughs> thank you so much, Thomas. And I, I, I definitely am interested in talking to you more after that really great presentation you gave, and I'm sure there are people in the room who want to speak to you more about Gaia, so thank you for that. I hope I can speak to you better one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on 
quickly to Gwen Sharp, who is here to talk to us about the Green Room. Uh, hi, everyone. I have my notes as well. Don't worry, I feel you. <laughs> um, so my name is Gwen. I run an organization called The Green Room, uh, which is based in France, as you might hear. Um, and so we support uh, musicians and uh, music profes professionals uh, on changing our practices in a fairer and uh, greener way. Uh, and I'm here today to present you the, our newest project called uh, Stomp. Um, as you might know, um, uh, the digital technology represents about 4% of the, um, the carbon emissions, uh, worldwide uh, speaking. And uh, in the music industry, it's um, a very essential uh, tool nowadays for the whole operation and the whole uh, creative um, uh, value chain of the music industry. And at, at the same time, it has a very important uh, impact on the environment, even beyond uh, just uh, carbon. Um, and the, this topic is uh, still very rarely discussed in the, in the music industry. Um, and at the same time as uh, music professionals, we are also facing a lot of uh, contradictory injunctions between uh, going for more digital, but at the same time being more uh, ecological uh, responsible. Uh, so with uh, this project, uh, we, we try to propose an overview of the, of the issues as, at stake, and also to propose various tools and uh, initiatives that can um, help to fill this, uh, this blind spot. Um, in short, uh, the project uh, will start with a state of the art. So we are running currently uh, different uh, interviews with uh, music professionals and music um, musicians. And we will also have a, a questionnaire uh, to also assess the needs of musicians. Uh, going uh, into their practices, but also the time they spend on um, um, social media, for instance, but also if they know their rights when they put their music out there. And, and then we will produce a practical guide uh, aiming at musicians, but can which can serve also the whole uh, industry with a toolbox of technical solutions that uh, will be uh, there. And then we're also uh, commissioning uh, some essays, more like prospective essays, on what the future of um, uh, a sustainable digital uh, world could look like, uh, looking into low techs, but also um, looking into what could be the alternatives uh, for, um, to keep, uh, let's say, uh, the way that artists need to be uh, promoted online but to, to look at this in a, in a more um, uh, sustainable way. Uh, the guide will be uh, published uh, on our website. It will be also eco-design, as we are kind of uh, doing this ac action research and also testing some tools ourselves. And it will be available in French, in English, and in Polish. Uh, we are closely working with uh, an organization in Poland, which is uh, specialized in eco-design of, uh, of uh, digital tools, sorry. And if you want to see, if you don't know what a, an eco-design website looks like, for instance, you can have a look at our uh, website, The Green Room. Um, yeah, um, and the idea is also to go, uh, as I said before, beyond uh, just uh, uh, carbon issues, but also because we know that uh, um, digital tools and the resources that we need are putting a lot of pressure um, on water and also on different uh, resources that we need and multi create multiple types of pollution. Uh, but also uh, they raise many uh, social and, uh, and ethical issues that we want to tackle uh, also with this project. And uh, just in terms of calendar, so we just started this project. It's funded uh, by uh, a an, an European initiative called Musicaire, which supports the recovery of the music industry in a fairer, and more resilient, and greener way. Uh, we're still lucky to be able to apply for <laughs> EU projects. Um, so we are conducting right now the research phase. We will launch the guide in October, if everything goes well, and then have some webinars also French, English, and Polish uh, in November. Uh, so I'm here with David, which is 
here also, and there's also my colleague Lucy. So if you are interested, if you want to know more, or if you would be happy to, um, to answer to some of our questions, uh, please get in touch. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Gwen, for sharing those details about the STOMP project for online musicians. And finally, we have Cerise Cooper here to tell us all about, again, building the supply chain infrastructure for reusable packaging. Okay, thank you so much. Um, just want to do a quick hands up. Anybody see the benefit in recycling this glass bottle versus reusing it? Anybody hands up? No, fantastic. I'm talking to the right audience. Brilliant. So uh, I'm from a company called Again. Uh, and Julia uh, kindly introduced us earlier on in her talk on circularity. Um, so what we do is we're trying to implement ourselves within brands' infrastructure in their supply chain. Uh, so we have built what's called the Clean Cells. It's a, it's a cleaning technology. Uh, we've got it inside here into a 40-foot shipping container. What we do is we take brands' packaging from the doorstep of consumers and uh, through our online retailers. And then what we do is we take it with us uh, we uh, delabel it, we remove all the closures, uh, we clean it, we dry it, and it goes through a computer visual inspection machine. We have the capacity to run uh, 500,000 units per month, um, and we are also um, built our system with Camden BRI, so we're completely food safe. Our unique part about our business is that we're able to tag our bottles, so we're able to put on a unique QR code um, that, that tells us how many times your bottle has gone through the loop system. And as well as that, what it can also do is your customers can also scan the QR code and it can take them to any platform that you would like, whether that be your sustainability platform on your website, whether you work with a charity and you want to promote them, and also we're able to give uh, live LCA data on that bottle itself. Um, so what we do right now is uh, we're currently collecting through online retailers. We work with Abel and Cole, Milk and Moore, and the Modern Milkman. Hopefully you'll be able to see us coming up. We're, we're a startup. We've been going about 18 months, but right now we're con concentrating on glass bottles from these online retailers. Uh, we're also working uh, in Scotland with the National DRS scheme up there. Um, and we're also working very closely with Biffa to actually be able to collect a lot more waste that's going through. We run it through our clean cell, and when we literally deliver it straight back to brands, uh, whether that be their foot filling line, production line, or straight back to their head office. And we do it in exactly the same way that brands receive their virgin glass. All you'll see is that it's come from a gain as opposed to a glass supplier. So what are the benefits of a gain? So we're able to, with five loops of one bottle, we're able to save 60% on our carbon footprint. <coughs> Uh, even just going through one loop with one glass bottle, we're able to save 20%. We're able to either match or be cheaper than the glass, uh, the virgin glass that brands are buying in right now. And that is not including the eco taxes that are coming in. So brands are being, you know, the, the actual glass price itself is going up dramatically. They're having to pay for PRNs and also EPRs, so eco taxes on glass. Um, what's great for brands is there's literally no zero upfront capital. We are literally putting ourselves in the middle of your supply chain um, and with absolutely no disruption. All that we would like is a wash-off label on a bottle that's easier for us so that it reduces the cost. Um, and in-house, we have um, our technical packaging manager. We also have our um, chief technical officer. And we're all working together to be able to make reuse easier for everybody. Uh, so these are some of our partners that we're working with. So we're really proud to have been able to close the loop with uh, two of our partners here, um, Tom Parker Creamery and some Magic Juices. So we're collecting through Milk and More for them. And we've gone through a few months now worth of loop cycles and they're able to track their data live. Uh, we're also working with Diageo on our R&D project up in Scotland to reuse all of their uh, spirit bottles. And we're also in discussions with Coca-Cola on reusing their products, their one litre glass bottles here in the UK. We have a multitude of investors and our collection partners, Biffa and Maersk. Um, and yeah, this is kind of an overview of um, who we are. Um, I'll be around uh, later on if you'd like to come and talk to me. That'd be fantastic. Um, what we're kind of looking for is anybody that has any great ideas about brands that they know that would be love to be involved in a reuse platform. 
Um, we're extending out as well to a return from home scheme with Waitrose, so we're actually going to be able to get their online deliveries. Uh, when you, the delivery people, they drop off the shopping, they're going to pick up the packaging and we sort it within our distribution center and we send it straight back to brands. So, um, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Cerise, and thank you to all of our panellists. I'm just going to run through them quickly again so you know who to come and talk to later. So we had Christmas Streetchi talking us about innovation and intersecting bins for engagement. We had uh, Danny from uh, Swan Cycle, uh, Carnival talking about sustainable carnival use. We had Thomas Richardson from Gaia, the Global Ecological Investment Agency. We had Gwen Sharp from the Green Room talking about Stomp, which is sustainable tools for on uh, Run out on online music practices, sorry. And then we had Therese Cooper finally with a great uh, overview of again. So please come and find them after the break. I'm Abana Fairweather, I'm from Legacy Marketplace, and that's the end of our quick fire session. Thank you. Thank you.